Are we going to be going over some um, uh, price action and charts with Christopher today? Is that uh, some of the well, plan? Luke, I think the first thing I'd like to do is talk about our out of control government and our what seems like. And, and I would li actually like you to maybe bring the uh, audience up to speed on. Uh, I've been busy kind of in a closet taking care of some other things. And I'm hearing all this mayhem and, and craziness going on in uh, universities around the United States. Uh, Chris, I'll pop you up here in a second. Um, like what what's going on there? And then, you know, you hear all this shit about the SEC. Then it goes quiet. Like, you know, what's happening with the whole Gensler and the lawyers being dismissed? Uh, can you can you kind of bring me up to speed and the others? Geez, there's almost, um, yeah, that's actually a lot there. So Consensus filed a lawsuit against the SEC commissioners over uh, Ether, right? And like, because uh, they're expected to deny, I think, the spot Ethereum ETFs next month is what some industry sources are saying. And then like the university stuff, of course, is just, I want to call it typical university student stuff where... Just people clashing, students clashing over the Israel-Palestine stuff going on. And you kind of have these issues between do these students have a right to protest and use their First Amendment on, you know, university campus grounds. I think the big, uh, the big media piece was what was going on at Columbia University where these people, I think the school itself stopped a professor from going to speak and i believe he was going to be speak from a pro-israel stance and the school itself was like no you're not allowed to do that we're revoking your credentials and there were all these protesters so that's creating a lot, a lot of like freedom of speech kind of issues like where do you draw the line between freedom of speech and anti-semitism which continuously crops back up um and then i mean some other stuff like i saw um, oh, what was it? The Samurai Protocol. Protocol is not the right word, but uh, the U.S. Yeah. government just imprisoned the co-founders of, of Samurai, which is really interesting because I remember meeting those guys at a conference maybe two years ago, and it was really funny because I was asking the guy, I was like, hey, what do you guys do? What's your purpose? And when I asked him for his name, he wouldn't give me his name. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a little weird. Uh, but I'm like, well, it's not that weird, I guess, in this space. And now I get it because now the co-founders are uh, have been arrested. So uh, there's a ton yeah, of and, and by the way, you also look sky. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> I look like a Fed. I understand that. And so anytime, I get that comment all the time. People are like, you just look like a cop. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not trying to look like a cop, but I guess it's the haircut. So that's my own fault. Um but then on top of that, we had Biden announcing the 44% capital gains plan, um, you know, in the U.S., in the, in the president's budget, of course, to pay off, all under the excuse to pay off the deficit, which makes no sense uh, in modern day. He, he, he really knows how to float a balloon, huh? And, <laughs> and, get, and get votes. Is that what that's called in politics, floating a balloon to see how much backlash you're going to get on 44%? I, you know, the budget is always a marketing tool, and so you could view it as to see how much backlash you get, but it's also like a, uh, here's what we want to do down the road, and so it's supposed to be an opportunity to say, here's why you should vote for us. I'm not entirely sure a 44% capital gains is going to get him a lot of voters, because... Even it your won't average, get them forty. It won't get them forty-four voters, bro. No, no, because the idea is, which is still weird to me, let's do this to balance the budget and get the wealthy to pay their fair share. But the message is kind of lost when inflation is terrible, uh, when you know the economy continues to not be great for what I view as a majority of Americans. So they're not exactly <coughs> focused on. The capital gains tax. I think a lot of people were looking forward to maybe some more sensible issues from the Biden economic plan. Um, and, you know, with the media cycle being as crazy as it is, I think it's already drowned out by some of the other larger issues like what's going on university campuses right now. Uh, and this is all we yeah, but to me, to me, you know, the most important thing, Sam, here is this, the, the one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the Columbia riots, because I do think this spreads. I think this is not a U.S. thing. It's going on 
all over the world. People are starting to fight back. I don't think this is normal. Okay, this reminds me of the 50s and 60s rebellion from the Vietnam insanity. Um, the censorship is the issue here. Like, this is now going to be a fight over freedom of speech, and we have been woked into being okay not seeing all the images of war. Like, I think that was yeah. our many mistakes we have made, and one of those is, hey, you should not be censoring these images of war. You should be publishing them. I want to see them, and I want people to get ill. I want people not to be able to eat at night over their dinner table because they're being flashed with scenes of uh, true war versus the Hollywood shift they get, which is, hey, strip down is, you know, as much clothes as possible and dance around to a bad song, and you'll make a million bucks. Yeah. We, we have this also backwards, and I hate to be the kind of, you know, guy that's like, excuse me, but, like, we have to do something now. Okay, this has gone on way too far. I'm, I'm so grateful for Bitcoin because I think it hedges me and my family against what I see as catastrophe, man. I mean, I see this thing unraveling so fast right now uh, that it's really, really concerning. So the point is the censorship, and that's why one of the reasons why we brought Sam on the team, guys, because I want to get you and myself a better angle on all the stuff that's going on because uh, Bitcoin's not going to solve every problem. I'm sorry, it's not going to. Not even if it's at twelve thousand or tw twelve million, it, it's not going to solve every. It's not going to make the psychosis go away. Hey, can we uh, let's talk about while we're talking about our great country and its ability to uh, manage just the little peoples, the, the college uh, mm. peoples. Um, What's going on with Gary Gensler possibly holding a couple million dollars or a million some odd dollars of XRP and lawyers being uh, encouraged to leave early? So that the most I know about that was that the um, the lawsuit brought against the SEC came about essentially the result being that there was some foul play and probably Dan Spooler, who I'll call up later, can comment more on this. There was some foul play from the SEC not following certain rules, their lawyers going out of bounds. And when that was discovered, they had to resign. Right. And I don't know if they quote unquote had to resign or if the SEC was like, listen, guys, you got caught. You need to save face and just like step down. Um, that was the last that I saw. Uh, I'd have to call, you know, probably Dan up for that, which we can talk about that later. But the key being that the SEC is clearly overstepping its bounds. And finally, that's kind of being shown to the point where, like, they can lose a lawsuit, and that's great. And anytime they lose a lawsuit, I think that's great. But for their actual legal team to be forced to resign, I think is a huge win. A huge win. Because now they're losing resources. And, you know, maybe those lawyers are going to be happy because they'll go on to work for some giant law firm just because they can say, oh, I was at the SEC. I'm sure they'll be taken care of because they did the job that the SEC wanted them to do. But they were the fall guys, right? And so they got caught messing some stuff up, breaking some rules, and they were forced to, forced to step down. So kind of a win, I think. Um, but I guess yet to, we, we have to see. Yeah, well, if this is happening in one division of the kingdom, it will be happening in all divisions of this little kingdom. Because, like, this is just like a corporation, okay? Whatever the guy at the top, his culture, his ethics, his manners, rhythms, his, who, and whoever's at the top, girl, boy, or, you know, confused. Uh, dude, th this is systemic criminal activity okay you, you're basically back to gestapo days um yeah and to uh to clarify so the situation a utah judge criticized the sec for a gross abuse of power and two of the agency's lawyers resigned and the two former sec lawyers in question were heading a case against digital licensing inc or which is a which I guess owns a crypto platform known as Debtbox, um, and so there was a lot of false statements and risk representations, 
And so that's what's so interesting about the U.S. system, by the way, is judges judges can really flex, and it doesn't have to be even a federal judge necessarily. And that can be good and bad, by the way. Uh, but in this case, this judge said this was you know, gross abuse of power, and that was enough to get them to step down. Well, when was the last time that's happened? When when an agency is called out by another agency, I mean, this I, see. I think, but it, I think it's systemic. It's going on all over the place, and it's going to get exasperate. And when these riots are going to exasperate. And speaking of exasperation, Chris, uh, I just read that a large investment firm with sixteen thousand advisors are getting ready to be released from their leash and actively. Promote Bitcoin. 16,000 professional investment advisors are getting ready to be le unleashed, guys. I think it's got to be great news. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I think you're referring to uh, Morgan Stanley there, right? I wanted somebody else to use the big name because I don't like <laughs> name dropping. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, this is something um, Andrew... Uh, Jesus, was I can't remember his handle at the moment here. Uh, Abacus, Andrew, if you're listening, man, I'm sorry, but yeah, Abacus something. Anyway, he's been uh, following along with this, and he mentioned it like uh, probably about three or four weeks ago. Was talking about how um, uh, how Morgan Stanley was uh, looking to to do exactly this, um, and was was pretty close to doing it a few weeks back, and then got hit up in some red tape uh, with the company itself. Uh, and then they were looking to, you know, come on through like they're doing. And so, you know, I'm not surprised this is happening. Uh, you know, Andrew's been pretty dead on with what he's been saying for quite a while now. Um, and uh, I just, yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. You know, that's a that that's a big name. Uh, the other one that he mentioned was fighting to try and get out before Morgan Stanley is UBS. So uh, another, you know, another big one there. So a lot of potential um, inroads. For people into these Bitcoin ETFs uh, about to open up here. Yeah, opened up and promoted actively, right? That's a big deal uh, when they're actively promoting, right? There's no one's going to get fired now for not promoting. They'll only get fired for not hitting their targets. The best marketing people on the planet for Bitcoin. Never seen this kind of marketing before. I think it's so exciting. Hey, speaking of the Morgan family... Did you hear the J.P. Morgan? I found this to be the irony of the month. J.P. Morgan and reportedly 400 wealthy families have had their assets seized from the Russian government. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but we expected that, right? I mean, I, I think uh, probably I, Samuel I'm, expected I'm that. I'm stunned it's in the news, man. I mean, what do you expect when you do that to them? Right. This is not game theory. You can't keep pushing the, the bubble over to other people and saying, hey, I'm going to cut you off from spending. Well, and um, or energy. Chris, Chris and I, Chris and I were talking about this, just tweeting. What was it yesterday, the day before? Because the fascinating thing is, why didn't Russia do that earlier? That's the question, because we seized their assets over here way long ago. So what Russia did is they essentially they said, hey, everybody, this is what happens when you invest in the U.S., if you ever do something they don't like, they can just seize your assets. So that was warning number one. And then warning number two was the Russians essentially said, we're not going to immediately retaliate. We're going to show the world, primarily the third world countries, hey, we're the good guy. And here's why we're the good guy, because we're actually going to try to go through. And when I say try, I don't mean like they actually tried, right? This is all presentation. We're going to try to go through the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, and try to uh, make this a fair decision as to us wanting to get our assets back, which we believe we rightfully should be able to do so. And so when that didn't happen, now they're simply stating, okay, well, actually, the, the assets we're seizing from the U.S., we're just saying that's owed to us from the assets that the U.S. sees. So look, world, we try to play fair. The U.S. doesn't play fair. So they forced us to finally essentially accept the terms and conditions of this of this fight. And we're going to take their assets and retrib retribution of our own that were taken, I think, over six months ago now. 
So to me, just the, the time period and kind of when you're talking about marketing, especially around war, I mean, modern warfare is all about marketing, right? And right now, I think Russia understands that. I think uh, a lot of these countries have realized, okay, it's about the message, not what's happening on the ground. It's what you're showing on the ground and what you're not showing. And so, yeah, to me, that was the most interesting thing because that was the first question. I was like, wait, Russia hasn't seized assets already? Like, if we were at war, war, if this was like World War II levels war, you would have thought that would have happened immediately. So it's it's just warfare is so different now. I mean, it's not, but it is, right? Yeah, I think militaries have been seizing assets for centuries, right? I mean, it's just quid pro quo. Uh, but I think now, this time, it's a, basically a finger in the face saying, hey, this is what happens when you sanction and embargo and intervene in global markets. And that's what's happening right now. It's a global market that's fractured all over the place, and the U.S. government doesn't like it and because it's, it's going to be very hard for them to control. And that means their egos are going to have to, like, step back and realize we're a piece of this global market now. We're not the dominant King Kong. We're going to spray, you know, U.S. urine all over the place if we don't like you. Uh, sorry to be so so uh, dismissive of the whole thing, but it's just all you got to do is look at the results, right? This is not working well for anyone. I, I just don't know any positives that are coming out of our uh, our actions. Um, anyway, Chris, tell us about the price action on Bitcoin. It's trying to test six, the low 60s. It's trying to push up through 64. What's going on, man? Yeah, you know, again, uh, range bound. We dip below there. Looks like we printed uh, what we refer to as a spring. Um, so now we just need some confirmation on movement up. Uh, I posted uh, earlier today, this morning, I guess it was, um, this local uh, ending diagonal wedge kind of thing I was looking at with the throw under. We got that. We got the breakout. Um, and so now I'm just looking for follow through above uh, 67,200. If we can do that. Uh, I believe we test the top of the range, and if we hit in the top of the range area there, um, that should be an indication that we're about to break out to new all-time highs. Uh, we'll probably pull back a little bit first from that all uh, from the top of the range, but then uh, break on out and head higher, which you know is what people are very adamant that's not going to happen. Which you know, just always makes me a bit more um, makes me feel a bit more be a bit better about the idea that it probably will. So, so you're, you're hearing generally that people are a little bearish that they think this is going to stay here for a while or go down? Oh, yeah. I, I, it seems like what I'm seeing a lot more of is, uh, you know, especially as the range continues to, uh, to range, uh, is just this idea that uh, price needs to go down, you know, 32,000, 20,000, whatever. Um, it, it's just, you know, it's basic human psychology when it comes to markets. Uh, people can be really bullish until it starts ranging, and the longer it stays in range, the more people, the more time people have to sit there and convince themselves that it's got to turn and go the other way. Um, and and so if you don't understand ranges and what's actually going on there with the uh, you know with the professional traders and retail and whatnot, um, you know it can become pretty scary because you're sitting there waiting for it to go out higher. You're like, man, oh man, I really don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm in some profit here. Should I go ahead and take profit? Or should I just hold on because it's going to break up higher? And again, the longer you spend in the range, we've been 40 plus days in this range now, uh, the more people start freaking out. We can think back to, uh, I guess, what was it? Most of last year, uh, we spent like six or seven months in that range um, that first time. Uh, kind of a range similar to what we have here, but we just, you know, much more drawn out. And at that time, everybody and their grandmother was swearing to us that it had to drop back down to 20 or 15 or 12 or 3 or whatever they were saying. Um, and, you know, again, just kind of did the double touch on the bottom of the range and then uh, took up and head off. And uh, kind of looking at the same idea with this one, just not as long term. Uh, and we had a little bit of a dip below it, again, printing what we would normally refer to as a spring. See, Chris, correct me if, I, if I'm mistaken here, but the longer this structure, I see this more as a structure, right? I don't think of ranges. I mean, I, I know exactly what you're saying, but that range is making up a structure that when we go higher, and we will go higher, guys, we will ha absolutely test some higher number to see, hey, is it going to continue or is it going to drop? But once it drops back down to that, from that 
test. I think we're creating a structure that's really going to be fundamentally very strong. There's a lot of volume trading here for the last 40 days. I would love to see this go on for another two months. One, I get to, I get to create more fiat. That's the first advantage, right? I have more time to play in this structure. And, okay, maybe the structure breaks down into the 50s. It's never played into the 50s very long. There's just air there, man. And, and I, that doesn't scare me at all. Like, I, I'm like, hey, it blew through 50. It doesn't ever want to go back to 50. It just blew through 50 like it was a Kleenex. So it, am I wrong, dude? Is this going to be an awesome structure once we get to 120? Am I going to have a lot of confidence? I will be able to get out at 65 if I want to, right? I mean, it may go below that. I'm not saying that. But we'll sit at 65 for a long time in the future. Yeah, so, you know, again, um, we're building, like you said, a structure, right? We're, we're building uh, what, once we break out higher, will be a base. Um, and there's a, there's a good bit of volume right there, around 66,000, uh, right here in this range, uh, in this structure here. And so, yeah, you know, the idea is uh, once price rallies up higher, if it were to pull back to this level, um, there's a good chance it would hold as support or at least give you a good bounce before it breaks down any further. And, um, you know, the rally up to the 50s is just the market telling you they're not interested in that area. We've got, we've got a lot of really low volume in that area. Uh, and, you know, what we, what we generally look for is when you have these lower volume areas, they tend to work as support resistances. Um, the market's not really interested if you're, you know, if, if there's a, an area below you and you're dropping down toward it, and the market's not really interested, you don't want to put a heavy sell in there because what happens is you don't have any interest. So price is going to just rocket down through it. And if you're trying to sell, what that means is you're selling for, you know, on average, a lot lower price. Uh, same thing to the upside. If you're trying to buy and you've got this, uh, you know, this, this low area above you where just there, the market's been through there, it's just not showing you that it's really interested, then what happens is you tend to not want to to buy a lot right before that because you're going to push right up through it. And, you know, if that area was, you know, if you're down at 50 and that area is at 55 and the next uh, higher volume area is around 60, I mean, instead of getting your buys filled at 50 to 55, you might get your buys filled at 55 to 60. And so effectively, you know, you've got, you're, you're paying a lot higher price. So what you're looking at is when you're seeing these areas where there's little volume at these price levels, you're usually going to see the wicks there. You're usually going to see it on both sides. And when it does break through, it's usually on a strong, big candle that pushes through it. Because, again, you just chase through it. There isn't price acceptance. You get to the bigger areas where there's a lot more price acceptance. And that's when, when you hit it and the market's willing to, to buy and sell at those areas. So, yeah, you know, um, the idea that, you know, I, I think the, I think the, as I've continued to say, even if we were to um, dip below that 59,000 area, I'm not convinced that it would necessarily run all the way down to 50. It, it could, but with the lack of interest really in the 50s, um, you'd have to have a decent push through it just to get it going um, and then chase it down to where you have that price acceptance down there much lower. Totally, totally, because you know it's just going to get all bid up in 48. I mean, it's anyway, I, I just I like the price action right now. I think the structure is good for a long term investor. The structure offers so many opportunities and it does offer exits. Um, you know, if, if everything were to go to shit, I do think you'll have 30 or 40 days on decent volume to get rid of your position if if, uh, if you got washed out. So if you're really worried about that, uh, it's just the way I look at it. It may be wrong. I know you wanted to bring uh, Dan up, Sam, and I've been bounced into the the market. You want to flip back to, to politics and introduce Dan? Happy to uh, just bounce around him. I'm sure these guys can handle a little variety. Yeah, Dan, uh, I've had Dan up here before, really good friend of mine, also in – in D.C., North Carolina, really in tune with what's going on. And I just wanted to make sure I wasn't just talking out my ass earlier about some of the SEC stuff. So, Dan, would you just mind filling me in if you got any, like, updates or news on that front or what you're seeing or what you've heard being kind of yeah. ear to the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks for having me up. Uh, great to see everybody again. Thanks for having me up. 
Yeah, it's been a busy week. I mean, it was only Thursday, and there's already been two massive lawsuits uh, issued against the SEC. And then earlier this week, on the 22nd, they had their Dan, response. Dan, that you Dan I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Just yeah. one second. Hey, guys, there's 200 people in this room, okay? Dan and Sam have years and years of political experience. Please retweet this space. Five people. I'm one of them. Four people retweet this space. Come on, man. Put a billboard out there. Bring some people into the room. Invite your daddy, okay, your mom. I don't know anybody that has enough friends or financial understanding, so bring them in the room. Thanks. Sorry, Sam. Oh, Dan. No, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, again, to your audience, I'm Dan Spooler. I'm uh, head of industry affairs for the Blockchain Association in D.C., and, and I'm from North Carolina. I'm still pretty active in the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative. But regarding the SEC, um, yeah, earlier this week, Sam, you mentioned – the two SEC lawyers that quit over the uh, debt box case. Yeah, so they were, um, I mean, that, that was a pretty serious topic and it kind of got overshadowed. But earlier in this year, you alluded to what had happened out, out in Salt Lake City with the judge. Um, they were really, uh, the, the individuals were Mike Welsh and Joe Watkins. They stepped down this month after the, the SEC official told them that they would be terminated if they stayed. Um, and so those were the two that were lead attorneys on the case against digital assets scene, which was the crypto platform known as Deadbox. a uh, huge black eye for the SEC. And honestly, these two guys are cooked when it comes to their legal future. I mean, this is, this is like a death sentence for if you fear an attorney and you, you, you have to, you're reprimanded like this. Uh, it is not good. So I don't, I don't think they're going to get any golden parachutes if I had to predict, but this also over underscores just the whole culture at the, at the SEC since Gensler took over, uh, so let me also mention just some of the lawsuits. So today, a big one dropped from Consensus, uh, you know, major Ethereum-based crypto companies been around for many, many years. Um, they high-level uh, put forward a lawsuit, um, essentially uh, asking finally for some clarity on are they going to yes or no or is Ethereum going to be declared a uh, security? And uh, this has been you know hot potato in Washington D.C. as well as the greater cryptocurrency ecosystem. The commission itself acknowledged Ethereum's status as a commodity uh, by proven securities products backed by Ethereum futures contracts, if you recall. So to me, it's just a head scratcher. And I know there's other attorneys probably on this call that can weigh in on that. Um, I don't. I, I think the, part of the big problem originally was when Ethereum switched its consensus mechanism from proof of work to proof of stake. You know, perhaps that opened up a can of worms on the, the status of their uh uh, how it would be declared, but at least consensus now is taking legal action to finally have the SEC put up or shut up, and it makes some clarity. And, of course, we all know that prior to uh, Gensler's status as chairman, he was a professor, and there's videos out there of him actually saying that Ethereum was not a security, it was a commodity. So we'll find out how this plays out, but consensus is a great company. And then the other lawsuit this week that my organization put forward, the Blockchain Association, we partnered with the Crypto Freedom Alliance of Texas to uh, file a lawsuit challenging the SEC's dealer rule, which is a really big issue, uh, especially in DeFi. Not so much Bitcoin, but definitely it's a major problem in DeFi. And it's not just us that oppose this. This is very, very strongly opposed by other entities like the Managed Money Fund uh, Association, you know, venture capitalists, anybody that's dealing with crypto tokens uh within their portfolio this is a very big concern and so we um you know i can get anybody some more information on this if you'd like but we're seeking a declaratory injunctive relief against the sec to overturn uh this dealer rule expansion uh and yeah so i mean it's been busy but there's quite a bit going on and i think um you know the two com what's happening really the the federal securities laws, when it comes to our lawsuit, it, it really only applies to instruments that are a security, and the SEC still hasn't even made that decision yet. So to me, the, another big part is they put the cart before the horse. Um, you know, this is really ridiculous. And um, yeah, we, I was up in New York City for the last two days, and you know, we met with a lot of our companies up there, a lot of investment funds, a lot of projects, and they're very concerned over this real broker-dealer rule. So I don't know if it will affect many people on this call, but it's something of concern for the greater blockchain ecosystem and uh you know we're going to court and sometimes if, if that's I, i'm not actually not really a fan of lawsuits to get things done i would prefer it to be done the old-fashioned way through legislation and rulemaking but uh it, this is this is where we're at now and i think we're going to continue to have these concerns at least through next year when we may have change in the administration dan i'm a 
I'm a big fan of lawsuits when it's one that I like. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when it's one I don't like, I'm not. But is this the uh, first time you guys have sued the SEC? Is this? Is yeah. The, this is the first time formally that, yeah, uh, the Blockchain Association itself has sued the SEC. You know, we considered it a couple years back during um, – uh, way back in 2020, during the, the, when Mnuchin was still Treasury Secretary, he was putting out um, some concern issues over unhosted wallets. Obviously, lawsuits are very expensive. You know, we were fortunate we had some good third-party help here to help. But this is our first formal foray into a lawsuit. And my colleague, Marissa Koppel, we got to get around this call one of these days. She can give you, uh, obviously, a lot more in-depth opinion on it. But we're excited about it. We think this is going to get a lot of traction, and uh, we're, we're going to bat for, uh, for the industry. I mean, I love to see this kind of stuff, especially if it's the first lawsuit. To me, that's, uh, as they say, bullish, right? Like, that's a huge bullish sign that people are actually fighting strategically as opposed to just kind of sitting and complaining. So, Dan, that's awesome. That's actually really cool. And I want to vouch, too, just every, I know the SEC is an enemy to a lot of people here, at least. Not a, maybe enemy, but a villain. Uh, I do want to point out, Hester Purse and Mark Udea, those, those are two commissioners that are actually very supportive of our industry. So I don't want to throw them into the same conversation because I think that their hands are tied, frankly, being in the minority. But they have had some, they put out some great comments and statements on this broker-dealer ruling. And um, I, I agree wholeheartedly. She has been a champion, man. I'm stunned. It how outspoken she's been, and I think really forthright, honest, without being like poison. Uh, hey, I wanted to ask you a question, Dan, because I think the guys in the audience would like to know this too, but what is it that these two lawyers, uh, w w what is the accusation? I mean, what did they do wrong uh, that they would, you know, this kind of treatment? I mean, how much noise must there be behind the closet door, right, that, that would lead to this i mean this does not happen easily right no it doesn't happen at all very easily um i, I think I, I gotta go ahead and reread it because it happened actually several months back when the actual you know statement happened but what in july last year the sec these two lawyers accused debt box and its executives of um of defrauding investors like 49 million dollars or so and um, at the request, Judge Shelby froze the company's assets, put them into receivership. But um, the asset freeze was reversed after the judge found out that those two SEC lawyers actually made materially false, quote, materially false and misleading uh, representations. So the judge then went on, he sanctioned the SEC for that gross abuse of power that was quoted in the article, um, entrusted to it by Congress. And he ordered the SEC to pay some of Debtbox's attorney's fees. And the judge also faulted the guy's name was Welsh. He was the lead trial attorney on the matter. Um, he reprimanded him. And, uh, yeah, there was, there was, there was a few other things where they were, I think they, the, the lawyer also accused, uh, us, the Utah based debt box of closing bank accounts and transferring assets overseas. Uh, that, that, that was found to be totally false. And so an SEC investigator led later claimed that it was a miscommunication that led to the error, which, you know, I, that's baloney. Um, and Welsh was a, he apologized, but they lost their jobs. And even the SEC's chief enforcement officer, Gerber Gruwal, he used to be the attorney general for the state of New Jersey. He's Gary Gensler's chief enforcement officer. He's, you know, a real powerful role there. He was even forced to apologize over the, over the, his, the these two attorneys. Wow. And, uh, that, and so that was a, a few months back, but you know, they, re they replaced them, but again, big black guy. And it just also just, it doesn't help when it comes to the faith in, in that agency uh, when you have these two folks doing this. I think personally, though, I think that their career is in serious trouble, those two guys. I don't see them really getting hired by a law firm anytime soon. And be clear, these are federal employees, right? Yeah, yeah. they were. Yeah, as of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> federal employees. Were, yeah. I mean, yeah. When you do Those something careers. like that it, and you're the federal government, is that considered a felony or like how how, how is that is there any kind of criminal suit for someone actually, you know, using the law, manufacturing data to put someone in prison, disrupt their business? You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't say because um, <laughs> they haven't the SEC declined to comment. And also a representative from the union that represented the SEC employees also refused to comment on it. So I, I don't know if there's going to be any additional recourse for these guys, but um, there might be. 
And I mean, frankly, I hope there is, um, because at least it would bring some justice instead of just being able to resign. Hopefully they'll be held accountable. I mean, it's great seeing some of these uh, marketing wins for the industry is maybe that's small as some people, but just to to demoralize the SEC uh, and let them know that, right, they're being attacked from all sides and because it all comes down to bandwidth, right? And one of the most fascinating things about the SEC under Gensler is they've decided to focus a large share of their political capital on this industry and attacking it. And they've been called out multiple times, uh, like, why aren't you guys looking at other things that the SEC is supposed to regulate? Why are you continuously focusing on crypto? So for them to then have to fire people, to apologize, to have lawsuit after lawsuit, bogging down even more time for their employees to not be able to do the jobs they're supposed to do, um, it's great for us. The only scary thing is that I don't know if they care. I mean, I don't know if they care that they can't fulfill their mandate as a federal institution and that they're just happy to, okay, at whatever cost, hit us with lawsuits. We're going to keep attacking your industry because we want to. Right. So it's just a really interesting political dynamic, I think. Um, And like with any federal agency, of course, the the lawsuit or the investigation is the crime. And that's why I know they don't always care if they win. Right. They're just happy to intimidate. But I hope it's giving the industry some like a morale boost when they see the SEC losing. It almost becomes like a badge of honor, I guess, to be attacked by them. Yeah, I think that's correct, man. I mean, it's definitely great marketing for a crypto team or team crypto. I see some people in the audience. I don't know if anybody in the audience has any uh, light on uh can shed any light on these issues and or the market jason welcome grant c welcome rob cunningham josh british marson hey guys good to have you in here um chris how would you like to handle this you want to do some q a it doesn't look like anybody has anything else to say you got any predictions for maybe what happens in the summertime or you're not looking that far out yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I don't think anything's really changed from what you and I have been talking about, you know, for the last few months. Um, I think overall, uh, you, you know, we just got to get out of this range. Once we, once we do, uh, there's that significant number, record level number of shorts there by hedge funds sitting up there around 73, 74,000. Um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to believe if we pop into that, that we don't catapult into the 80s um, pretty easily uh, due to the amount of shorts there. But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't think 100K is, is out of the question at all. Um, I think that's a step on the way. And as we kind of, you know, summers are generally slowish. Uh, so, you know, maybe we get this pop up into there, maybe into May and June. Uh, and then we get a pullback from 100,000 uh, through the summer. And then, uh, you know, coming up the end of Q3, beginning of Q4. Uh, maybe we start seeing some movement um, because historically Bitcoin's uh, you know moves quite a bit there as we get into Q4. So um, that you know that overall generally what I would kind of look for, but uh, with with the um, you know with Morgan Stanley potentially UBS doing their things and then of course all these other you know large RIAs uh, potentially starting to onboard and allow Bitcoin ETFs to be um, you know added. To what they do, uh, you know, th- that could just really just continue to just drive things up generally um, and, and not even do what we, you know, usually kind of expect to uh, expect to happen. I don't know if uh, we spoke about this earlier, but uh, I was on the phone with my banker. He handles 27 ultra wealthy players. And three years ago, I was the only player in his book that had digital and I was his smallest family. Um, today, two and a half years later, 25 of the 27 families are invested in Bitcoin, the ETF, some cold storage, some not, some exchange. It's all over the place. Most of those size investments are 250 grand only. Nothing yet. Like I look at that and go, oh, that's nothing for the, these people. And... I don't think we've seen that kind of money roll in, right? Like four or five Bitcoin at a time for the first bite. The interesting thing, he said, the two people who had not invested any 
were his largest whales, largest clients by a thousand miles. And they're just kind of starting to wiggle around on it. So this is exactly the way the money's going to flow. It's going to come in trickles, medium size, medium income, and just work its way up the step until the big waterfall comes. I'm quite convinced that that comes at the, you know, Q4-ish. I think that just floods the market with demand. Uh, I may be wrong, but it's going to be really, I think if we don't see that happen, Chris, by say November, December, I would say that we've pretty much seen the little, uh, I think Bitcoin's poop in the bed, quite frankly, if we don't see that demand drive a bunch of price action in that time period. Uh, Jason, what's up, buddy? What's up, fellas? Um, I had two specific comments. Um, you guys may have, you may have brought them up earlier, but I was hoping to speak to you, Gary and Dan in particular. Uh, anyone else can comment, but they're very concerning situations. So, the first one, you know, I've been around a long time, had a chance to invest in wallet mixers and intentionally avoided them at Morgan Creek Digital with the general feeling that you can't get around AML, KYC, and Bitcoin has always, be, has always been like semi-anonymous, but it's pretty much a public blockchain and you can track and trace uh, to the on and off ramp. So to try to obfuscate those transactions didn't seem like a smart thing. I also went as far as to say, if you participated in wallet mixing, that you probably were burning your Bitcoin. Now, fast forward to 2024, it appears that <laughs> that uh, the Samurai wallet founder and his chief uh, technology officer were arrested. One of them picked up in Portugal, and they seized the server in Iceland. Samurai uh, was one of those wallet mixers. I also saw a statement by the FBI. It looked like a general statement. I don't know if it's true or not yet. I haven't had a chance to research it. I was at the gym when it popped up. But it's stating that, you know, American citizens, beware. If you use non-AML KYC products in crypto, so that's sexes, dexes, MetaMask, etc., you are potentially using illegal money transmitters and could be participating in money laundering. I find this to be a very big deal, and I'm interested to hear people's comments on it. Dude, I, I agree. It is a monster deal, and this is going to be the fight for sure. And I, I'm like you, dude. I would never have touched a mixer. I, I think that's... You're obfuscating laws, right? Like there's a general, and maybe it's not the law, but, you know, ever since I've been alive, every country I've ever gone into said, hey, are you carrying more than 10 grand? And we've allowed that to kind of, even if it's not a law, we've allowed it to kind of become the base principle. Um, it's going to be hard to get that back, I think. And the mixer thing, it's just a... Uh, if, Jason, if you were running the country, would you would you allow that? Well, like, no, hey, I, gonna, I actually, yeah. Gary, I wouldn't allow it, and I wouldn't allow cash. Like, I would make cash illegal as well. Like, it's it's like if you if you really think about it, cash should be illegal, and they're they're essentially making cash go away. But like <laughs> that that is a problem. Like cash cash is a problem, just like digital currency. So I used to uh, I used to game theory this out at some of our conferences that we did. Um, the last one I did I think was last year, and I would essentially talk to the audience about how the government doesn't need to ban Bitcoin; it just needs to make the general public scared enough, or just Bitcoin hard enough to reach, or just not worth it enough to invest. Right. And so that's why when they go after these people like Samurai, and I think we saw it with Tornado Cash and we've seen it in instances before, it's all about signaling. Right. And just to your point, it's like, wait a minute. OK, am I uh, am I operating with an illegal money transmitter now just by using MetaMask? So it's the fear of the unknown. And they're OK with that. Ambiguity is a very good thing for those in power who want to use it against you because you really don't know. You really don't know until a lawsuit comes about. Um, 
And then the just a quick yep. tidbit on the cash and banning cash. And then, Dan, I know you'll have a lot more important stuff to say than I could. But one fun reason why the U.S. will most likely never ban cash, at least internationally, is because of the amount of cash that criminals use. We're actually okay with them using it as long as it's the dollar, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? The dollar, which is incredibly private and used for more criminal activity than any currency in the world. The U.S. actually doesn't mind that. We're okay with criminal activity happening as long as it's in the dollar, which is just kind of hilarious to me. But, uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, well, Jason, you want to get in there and get some opinions yeah, just, on that? Just what, yeah, thumbs down on the, the cash thing. They're going to they're gonna force the U.S. dollar. It's going to be a U.S. Uh, central bank digital currency like they're that but they're not gonna the ca cash is going away dude i go to stores now travel all the time they don't take cash yeah so maybe for and COVID was a psyop test for getting rid of cash transactions sorry samuel i didn't mean to interrupt you no i mean and that's very possible maybe for americans but once again like who uses cash drug cartels and isis so there will still be a money printer there will still be physical dollars, and they'll probably try to get your average U.S. citizen to stop using it. And that's also happening naturally, by the way. But my point being that they'll always print it because as long as there's a market for some kind of physical form of currency, they want that to be the dollar. Yeah, you know, I think the... I, I, I can't stand it when I see these companies and stores out there that don't accept cash. I mean, I get it maybe from a business standpoint, but I mean, to, in my opinion, I mean, if it's a legal tender, it's a note. I mean, and if it's physical cash, I mean, it says it right there in the bill. I mean, for all that's public and private. So I don't understand how that's a thing. But uh, no, we definitely need to keep cash. We definitely need to keep uh, the U.S. dollar strong. I strongly oppose central bank digital currencies. Just about everybody in our industry hates those the entire concept. Um, and we're pushing legislation across the country and state by state, and eventually, hopefully, at the federal level, because we got a solution right in front of us. And the solution to that is a dollar-backed stablecoin. You know, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm unique. I support the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin. I mean, I can I'm on both sides because I strongly support the United States. So I think that they can certainly coexist and. Uh, a you know, public chain dollar back stable coin like USDC or Paxos, pick one. Those are that's the solution, not a CBDC. But to the to the mixer discussion, um, you know, we put the BA lots, we we filed an amicus brief uh, earlier this year uh, in the DOJ's case against Tornado Cash and their developers. Uh, this is a real interesting topic, and but the one that we just has been in the news this week. Um, the samurai one. The, these guys, uh, it, I think this is a little bit different. I mean, they're, and before anybody jumps to conclusions, I think that everybody should really read the indictment pretty closely because these two devs, um, Jesse Williams and the other guy, they were charged with two acts. One of them was outright, run, outright money laundering, and then the other one was an operation of an unlicensed uh, money transmitter business. And that's a term FinCEN applied to crypto businesses as early as 2013 with mixers. They were put on notice. Uh, way back in 2019. And so if you look, I think it's page 18 of the indictment, Carol Van Cleef and a lawyer put out a pretty good thread on this. Um, these guys poked the bear in the eye. I mean, they wrote messages on Twitter. They welcomed Russian oligarchs to the Samurai wallet two years ago. Um, you know, they, 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 there's, there's some shenanigans here that I think people need to look at. So I'm not really going to die on the hill for these guys when it comes to this one. But the Tornado Cash one is a little different. Um, and I think that with Mixers, I mean, who are you going to hold accountable? I mean, because there's really no company. All you can really hold accountable now is these developers, and that was the problem, and that's really the concern. I don't deal with mixers myself, but it's something that I think is going to be more and more of a, of a focal point in the coming months and years in our industry. Hey, Samuel, before I go, I want to harden your statement because I agreed with everything you said, except for your, you need to bring the, uh, the rhetoric to felony charges because this is the setup. The setup is that the three felony a day rule, I love the book, Gary recommended and I read it. We, we essentially commit three felonies a day as, as citizens just doing our activities of daily living and it's set up that way. You can thumbs down, but it is the truth. And let me tell you, this cryptocurrency vagary that we're dealing with, this gray zone, these are felonies and they could bring the full force 
uh, against you. And I think the action is extraordinary taxation, if not clawing back uh, your crypto or cash because you participated in this and you pay up or you go to jail. That's how that's how draconian this could be. And that's uh, and, and Bitcoin's yeah. not fun to use. Let me let me put that out there as well. None of this is fun. As someone who's held Bitcoin a long time, none of this is fun. No, I think uh, that is a fantastic point, and I've stated that uh, in some podcasts previously. One of the reasons why our tax code is so complicated is because we are all breaking the tax code, whether we know it or not in some way, shape, or form. It can all be forced against you. My sister's breaking it. My mom's breaking it. My dad's breaking it. And so we're for simplifying the tax code, but there, there are advantages. And it's not just, man, I wish we had a simple tax code because I want paying taxes to be easy. Sometimes things are more complex for more nefarious reasons. Uh, and maybe it's not designed like that, but once it's discovered, hey, this is actually a complex system we can use to get people we want, then they have a vested interest in keeping it that way. So absolutely fantastic point, Jason. Appreciate you coming up, man. I think the question that we have to ask ourselves here is, is code speech and does the precedent that was set that code is speech stand um, and back the Constitution in that? And I want to read something here from Lynn Alden that she wrote on Noster. Privacy is normal and good. There has been an effort among authorities to make money laundering and financial privacy the same thing. That is, the mere act of moving money privately itself becomes a crime. That's not okay. Money laundering is when money is obfuscated through crime and is concealed by obfuscating it with clean money. The actual crime is the initial non-financial crime. And historically, money laundering involves manual activity to work with criminals. Now that open source tech can make certain transactions private, authorities increasingly equate all private money transfer with money laundering even if the developer of the open source tech had no direct involvement with criminals. Authorities target them regardless and sanction the technology itself. Financial privacy becomes synonymous with crime in their minds and in the minds of the public. And that's the real question here is, is, is writing code crime? Because at the end of the day, they weren't directly involved in criminals. And I, and I do understand the point that there were, they were antagonistic towards the DOJ, um, but we really have to go back to is writing code itself backed by free, the freedom of speech, which what which does have historical precedent in the Supreme Court. Isn't that crazy that that conversation's still around? I mean, that's been around since the 90s and maybe even earlier, right? Is is code free speech? And to my knowledge, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if we have a clear answer on that. Just how I don't know if we have a clear answer on whether the Constitution grants us a right to privacy, right, specifically. And I know even some of the more... Uh, larger politically charged Supreme Court cases that have been come down the pipeline the past two to three years have actually predicated on, do you have a right to privacy, right? And we're looking at some of these larger political issues, but some of them come down to, is that a guaranteed right? And I actually, I don't know. And I don't know if anybody knows. I know people have opinions. Hey, Sam, why don't we, why don't we open a room one night? You get all your legal buddies and we do a bill of rights and a constitution, like go over it over like, I don't know, four weeks, eight weeks, whatever. And I, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you the whole constitution. I'm a horrible American. It would be a great education for me. And I think a lot of other people, because we can come up here and talk smack all day long we want, but like we need to know what the rights are. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. The hard part is, the hard part now in modern day America is the rights are changing or they seem to be changing. And what's in the constitution and what's in certain laws seems to be very flexible. And it seems to be that honestly, if you just have the right relationship with the right lawyers and the right judge, uh, maybe the law doesn't matter. And so then it becomes even tougher because we can have every legal expert in the world say, well, this is how it's supposed to be. And then still be quote unquote wrong on some on something that okay this is just a new interpretation, which if you think about it is just incredibly dangerous because like, when like what's that what happened to Harvey Weinstein today is that like one of the things little loophole you just find a piece of dust and you focus on that piece of dust it's still yeah, a big problem and then you extrapolate that piece of dust to a huge degree when it works in your favor 
um, you know, or you have certain lawyers just decide, well, we're going to drop certain charges, right? Um, I mean, it's just kind of insane to watch some of the, min the minutia. Um, and it's, it's over my head. A lot of it's over my head because I, I can only know so much. And of course, I'm not an attorney. I just, you know, work with a lot of attorneys. But it's, it's insane because at the end of the day, when law doesn't matter, all that matters is the enforcer of the law. And the enforcer of the law is the one who gets to pick and choose what laws to be enforced and how it's to be enforced. And so ambiguity when it comes to law really uh, predates um, some sort of authoritarianism. And that is not a good thing in my opinion. Uh, but I'll get off my uh, soup box, soap box, whatever it's called. Uh, Simon, I, I know you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, and then I see Brianna. I hope I'm saying your name right, Brianna. Uh, you're up here too. So Simon, why don't you go ahead? Uh, hey guys, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'll get on my soapbox. Uh, to me, this is one of the most important things that Americans should be um, concerned about. Uh, this is where Americans define whether they're American anymore. This is the U.S. Constitution. This is property rights. This is freedom. Um, if you're not allowed to create code and then somebody else is, uses that code, which you can't stop, and therefore you can be a hold accountable for what happens with that code, then this is a slippery slope to communism. Um, property pri pro freedom of property rights, the ability to own your own property, um, the ability to, you know, the, the internet was built upon a foundation of laws that are required in order to make sure that those that, um, you know, the internet service providers cannot be held accountable for the things that people do on the internet. This is a slippery slope. Um, if people that manufacture cars can be held accountable for people um, committing crimes in those cars, um, this is where this goes. Now, if the people that created this code were using it for committing crimes, then they should be held accountable for those crimes. Um, but if you don't believe in the Constitution, um, this is exactly what made America what America is. And we have now come to America that's looking more and more like China every day, and China looking more and more like America every day. Um, you know, the banning TikTok, this is a communistic kind of way of doing things. Uh, holding, arresting people and holding people accountable for crimes based upon code where they cannot control how people use that code. Removal of property rights, you know, forcing people to sell their shares because you don't like how what the content that people are putting up on these social networks. Um, this is a, a really, really nasty, slippery slope away from, you know, the foundational principles of a small government and that constitution was written to keep your government under control and uh, it, it seems like America is no longer constitutional. Um, this is a really important thing to, to fight for and there's been many cases just like this um, and it, you know, this is, this is where you find out whether your judges actually believe in the constitution or whether they believe. You know, we've come to accept a world where it's okay that you don't own your money at a bank. It's okay that you can't spend your money. Um, that's a that's a pe that's a world that our parents and our grandparents um, think is a completely foreign type of world. You know, our, our fathers and our and our mothers and our grandparents they were they can't comprehend why even a bank would call you and ask you what you're doing with your money. They thought money at a bank was their own money. Uh, we've just come to accept now that it's not. And we even say cash is a waste of time. Cash is such an important thing. If you, if you don't believe in privacy and you think, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a criminal, therefore I have nothing to hide, then tell us your passwords. Tell us everything. That privacy is such an important foundation of society. Um, this is going to be such an important case. And, and these are, these are you know, the, the very debates that that brought Bitcoin to the world, just giving people the ability to own their own money, to spend money, and be held accountable for their own crimes because there's a mutable record on the blockchain. 
But making the people that create the code accountable for other people's crimes is how you create a state that's ruled by tyranny um, and, and a government that has excessive control, that has a slippery slope to um, making America what it probably hates about other nations. That's hey, my Simon. Um, high hope. But, but Simon, if I rob a bank in Nike sneakers, can I hold Nike accountable? According to this case, you can. I didn't mean to jump in front of people. I just wanted to. Uh, you, you know, say, but these analogies, I say things. Jason, these type analogies are really, really effective. I mean, this exactly. is exactly what the lawsuit with the FTC and my old company was. My position was, I am a document provider, dude. I technology that moves documentation across the rails very. I cannot possibly be responsible for an advertisement. One of 3,000 pages that that advertiser has. What are you talking about? And like that would mean that Intuit would be responsible for a illegal tax filing. I mean, this is such a slippery slope. It's unbelievable. So, but I don't think the mixer, the mixer, that's where they're going to, they're going to lean on the mixer doing something to obfuscate the truth, right? That's where they're going to lean in on that. And, and this is uh, Sam's point. Hey, the, the laws, you know, when I was going through this brutal divorce I went through in Florida, they were trying to pass a bill, and they've tried this eight times, uh, seven times evidently, pass a bill that says, hey, look, if there is a divorce, it is immediately assumed that the parents have 50-50 ownership. It's not a question. It's black and white. No matter what the other person did, unless it was a felony, I mean, really egregious, right? My lawyers are like, hey, it's going to get passed this year. I said, no, it's not, dude. There's no money in clarity, okay? But it's a shame what these, all these states that have this rule, if there was clarity, there would be no ambiguity over who owns, who has the kids. There's not, like, it just gets immediately assumed it's 50-50, and, uh, but without that rule, it allows for so many people to push. If you have enough money, you can just keep pushing the envelope. Uh, it's, it's so sad. And I think that's what our whole uh, entire legal system has become. It's not clear. And, and here's it's a, not uh, clear. How, how do you work your way out of a problem? I mean, you look, look at what Trump's going through. And on that note, like, here's a really fun story that's just been very relatable to what I've done in Florida. And then Brianna, I'll call you up. Um, Espinoza case, famous Bitcoin case happened here in Florida back in like 2012, 2013, 2014, not going to get into it, but in short, this judge essentially tells these prosecutors, Hey, we can't really get this guy for this charge because in Florida law, Bitcoin's not really defined. So the Florida legislature the following year defined it and then they could come back. The state could come back and say, aha, we got you. It's in our law. And now we can put you in jail. So you can the the government has all fun kinds of way of even if you once again have the best attorneys and even if you're like well the law clearly states now what i'm doing is correct i've literally seen it where government can say well shit okay guys time time to pass the law so we can go and specifically get, try this certain person or get this certain case um so it's just very interesting uh the way these levers are pulled uh brianna i know you've been waiting a while go ahead yeah, thank you so much. So in terms, I wanted to start out in terms of ambiguity, right? Ambiguity has really given rise to the fourth estate or the administrative state, if you will. And, you know, with Chevron deference or Chevron doctrine, the 40 year old Supreme Court holding, um, the administrative state has been given the deference to interpret whatever ambiguities are left over um, in, in, you know, laws passed by Congress. And, you know, in terms of like what Simon was saying, right? Um, do we have a constitution? Well, the FTC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? They have their own quasi uh, quasi uh, judic judicial sort of proceeding, and it's not based in constitutional law. It's based on their administrative um, 
and, and regulatory authority. And so, you know, you really have to pour through, say, for example, the Federal Register to understand what those laws even are. And to give a really great example of going back in time and altering the law, the TikTok quote unquote ban bill is a perfect example of that. So in 2020, when Trump initially, or excuse me, in, in 2019, when Trump initially authorized um, IEPA, which is the International uh, Economic or Emergency Economic Powers Act, to go after bite dance, um, they sued the Trump administration and won in court because it was found that the Trump administration didn't have the administrative uh, authority to compel divestiture. So three years later, and billions of dollars spent by ByteDance and TikTok to come into compliance under Cepheus and the Office of Foreign Asset Control, um, working hand in hand with the Biden administration, you know, we still watched IEPA be reauthorized on February 28, 2024, and then we still watched 7521 go through the House and give that or, or delegate that authority to the executive branch in order to compel divestiture. And, you know, it's not just about uh, the sort of weaponization of sanctions, which we are witnessing in real time in this country. Um, but it's also about the walls closing in on any type of escape mechanism because IEPA and these, you know, levers, if you will, with sanctions laws um, relate to everything. And in the most, you know, recent reauthorization of IEPA, uh, quite literally spells out anything, any type of transaction, any type of communication, any type of anything that connects to the internet, satellite, telephone, fax, right? Anything that we do essentially um, uh, really falls under the authority of the Department of Commerce and the Treasury Department at this point. So yeah, the walls are closing in on, on cryptocurrency, even um, gold and precious, uh, precious metals were recently uh, brought up under um, uh, the list um, through the Office of Foreign Asset Control as a very, you know, serious point of concern for uh, illicit transactions, for example. But, you know, back to your point about what we have constitutional rights over, I would say that we need to focus in on A, um, our constitutional authority and rights over private property, and then B, um, our constitutionally protected ability to transact and trade in commerce with whomever we see fit, because really those are constitutional protections. Thanks, guys. Hey, Brianna, before you go, quick, can you tell the audience what Chevron deference is, just in brief, when you refer to that? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah also, absolutely. Brianna, can, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Because I don't know you well, but, but and I suspect other people don't. I'd love just to know more about you so the audience knows you're not talking from a you know, cartoon uh, ad. Well, and it says you're a, a senior writer, too, but I, I don't see a link to any Substack. If you have a Substack, I hope you uh, link that somewhere. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you can look at my writings at the Brownstone Institute and also um, through the Beef Initiative. So I'm a senior writer and research fellow for the Beef Initiative Foundation. And we work on um, really my my sole purpose is to work on private property rights um, because really the value of the cow is a stored value and it is the value um, of our dollar really long term. Um, and so I work to outline sort of this fourth estate and the mechanisms of economic fascism um, essentially that we're witnessing in the United States right now, which is a, a uh, sort of financial coercion, if you will. Um, and yes, so my name is Brianna Sagdahl. I'm a senior writer and researcher. Um, I've been in policy for over a decade now and um, Oh, and Chevron deference. Chevron deference or Chevron doctrine is a 40-year-old Supreme Court holding uh, that started, I believe, under the Reagan administration. And it was hailed at that time as, um, you know, being this fantastic Supreme Court decision that allowed administrative agencies to um, have, you know, the ability to reasonably interpret questions at law so that it wasn't clogging up federal courts. Um, but really, over the last 10 years, I would say specifically, these administrative agencies have taken that, you know, reasonable interpretation guideline and have not only ran with it, but um, I would say at this point, they're promulgating new rules on their own. And this is easily evidenced by looking through the Federal Register. Um, you can look at almost any administrative agency at this point, and you can see that they are interpreting what, you know, limited authority is given through Congress vastly 
and, um, you know, really taking drastic liberties in their interpretation of their own authority in order to promulgate rule changes that are impacting the American citizen. And that is just really outside of the scope of these administrative agencies. Um, in, in truth, uh, these administrative agencies operate at the pleasure of the president. This is a branch of the executive. And they were never meant to um, interact with Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. And yet we're seeing this now on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm, I'm happy to give examples if anybody has questions about that part. Um, and any, I'll stand by for any other questions. No, that's one. I've never been so bullish on cows. Uh, that is amazing, Brianna. And then two, I remember reading an article how Reagan loved or promoted the Chevron Doctrine because at the time, judges kept shutting down a lot of his initiatives. And so he used his executive authority and Chevron Doctrine to essentially fight these judges shutting down his initiatives. And now that's flipped. And now it's come to bite a lot of people back, back in the butt. And I always find that interesting because power and how you treat power is so relative and in the moment. And we see this all the time. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm for or against this because I, I get the strategy. I get why it happens. I don't like arguing against human nature. It just is. But it's fascinating how one Congress or one president will say, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to break some rules because I want to get my agenda through. And Reagan, now we're talking 40, 50 years later, and we've seen this being used in the inverse way that someone like Reagan would have wanted it to. So I just... I always find that really fascinating. So really appreciate you coming up. Uh, and it's really cool because I read that article, I think, like three months ago. And I was like, oh, I get it. I get what she's talking about. Um, yeah. I know well, and, yeah. And, and, and just to add one last point to that, right, Samuel, because um, I brought this up in my most recent research paper, which is, um, I always forget the titles of my papers, but I think it was something like um, um, Sanctions, Economic Fascism, and the Slow Road to Owning Nothing. But, but I bring up this point about targeted, uh, micro-targeting messaging per demographic, right? Because you'll see essentially the same push for author authoritarian moves, um, but it's really packaged in a way that resonates with specific demographics. And I think that's really concerning because, you know, not only does it really uh, touch on your point made about, you know, how Reagan was so excited about this and now it's become such an antithesis to what he had ever really um you know, had hoped for. But I think it really helps to frame what we're watching in the media today in terms of policy advances and how it's packaged per demographic to get people on board and tacitly agree with essentially the erosion of their individual liberties, freedoms, and rights. So I guess my, my only last question for you would be, should I buy a cow or should I buy Bitcoin? Well, I would love for you to buy shares of a cow, and we can definitely talk about that more. I would love to tell you all about what we're doing at the Beef Initiative um, and give you guys all a great look into how you can help support your local economies and secure uh, food freedom and food security in your own backyard. Check us out at beefinitiative.com, and uh, make sure to hit me up in the DM, Samuel. Love to chat with you about that. Awesome. Thank you, Brianna. Wade, I know you've been patient and, and had your hand up for a while. Uh, before I get to you, wait, Gary, did you have any comments or Chris or Dan? I don't want to hog up the space. Uh, the, no, you're doing fine. I like it. I'm sure Chris uh, Chris hosts so many of these spaces. He's like, oh, wow, we have somebody else asking intelligent questions. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Chris is like, yes, please. Um, like, I really like this. And, and the, like, I just want to shout out to the 21 people who have reposted this out of the 400 people in the room. We're trying to bring you really high quality, not the same everything over and over again that these rooms tend to spin up. I am absolutely not interested in talking about price movements on Bitcoin every day because I'm in it for the long term. I, I will be right for sure about Bitcoin, but I ain't going to be right about the price tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. I love these people coming in here. We can expand this room. I've already thought of two. Like, why don't you guys get a bunch of you guys together and tell us what our freaking bill of rights are, what our rights are. Because the only reason I can understand why so many Americans are apathetic and, and quiet is they just don't know. Like, I want to just give them the, the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, you know, the last 50 or 60 years, we've just lost our way as understanding what our rights are. 
And the, you know, when I see a red light, I know, hey, I'm going to break the, break the law if I go through that red light and I might hurt someone. Um, but I'd like some red lights and green lights, and I don't think we have that. So anything I can do to help Sam, you know, I'm really trying to expand this. Uh, I, anything I can do to help on the. In fact, why don't you tell the audience what we did with uh, this week with Congresswoman uh, and uh, Anna Polina Luna. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I just posted on Twitter today. Um, so Gary and I, with a good friend of ours, Robert Blackman, co hosted a fundraiser for Congresswoman Anna Polina Luna. She's our Congresswoman, she's based out of St. Pete. And we raised over $75,000 for her. And the reason I stress this is I have never been a person who's just uh, here to talk. And Gary's not that way. A lot of people in this space are not that way. We can talk about these issues. But one, you got to act. You got to do something, right? And so raising money for candidates who support your vision is one way to do it. One of the reasons this was awesome for us is it's local, Right. So listen, guys, you don't have to be a Republican, Democrat, like you should get involved locally no matter what. And I don't care who your congresswoman or man is. I don't care what party they're a part of. But you should be locally involved if you really, really care about these issues, because we have run into multiple instances. I was in Tallahassee uh, last year uh, and a guy was sponsoring a bill that would have really hurt the Bitcoin industry here. I went up there with a group of people, we met with them, and within the first minute or so, we were saying, you know, we oppose this bill, here's why, and before we even said here's why, he said, I'll stop you right there, I haven't even read it. I haven't even read the bill, a buddy just gave it to me and said it was good for the industry, right? A lot of times, believe it or not, it's always an issue of, okay, are these people bad or are they just incompetent? A lot of these people rely on their inner circles, who they trust, to tell them what to push and what not to push. And unless you're actively getting involved and saying, hey, by the way, this bill is going to kill my business, they legitimately might not know. And so as useful as these spaces are, I hope everyone in the audience is following up and figuring it out. How can I get involved? If you're a Democrat, go to your local Democratic meeting. If you're a Republican, go to your local Republican Party meeting and start meeting with the decision makers. And so Gary and I were just fortunate enough to fundraise and have a great time with Congresswoman Luna. Uh, we're going to be hopefully doing a podcast with her soon and some other congressional people, which I think is going to be really awesome and fun. But that's what it looks like, and it's not impossible. So I uh, just wanted to shoot that out there. And that was that was a really fun night, really exciting. Uh, Wade, go ahead. I know I said I was going to call you up a bit ago, and then we just talked for five minutes. So sorry, boss. Come on up. What you got to say? No, thanks for the space, guys. Let's uh, hope you're all having a good uh, evening. I just wanted to jump back to one what Brianna was talking about and kick a question to her, and then to go back to what Gary was saying regarding the uh, the three felonies per day, and maybe I can give you guys a little bit of inside baseball from what that looks like from a guy's perspective who's referred hundreds of financial crimes cases to the uh, to the Department of Justice over my career. Um, I would say one of the first things that we kind of learn when we go through our courses and go through our academies and whatnot is you, you don't necessarily have to take a financial crimes case as a money laundering case. It doesn't need to be a multi-million dollar thing. You look at 18 U.S.C. 1956 structuring. That's exactly what Gary was talking about when you're crossing border controls and whatnot. Failure to report $10,000 or more in currency. Um, is, uh, is a Bitcoin transaction... Uh, uh, Subject to to 18 U.S.C. 1956, I don't know. You have to ask some of the attorneys or ask someone on the court what their disposition is regarding that. But I think it's important to remember that a lot of these investigations are basically run by political D.C. elements out of these investigating agencies, investigating bodies. You're generally not always getting just like working class guys who've been through the course, working class guys and girls who've been through the course and are trying to do the right thing for their investigations. There's, there's political... Uh, there's political aspects between all these things and, you know, what's a particular, uh, uh, agency head, uh, trying to push or what type of pressure is he getting from whatever committee or the current administration, uh, that's in charge. But I also wanted to go back to kind of some of the, um, some of the Fourth Amendment uh, issues uh, that are involved in here. And I don't know, I just think that a basic reading of the Fourth Amendment, 
uh, states that the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against uh, unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. You, you know, you need a sworn warrant to go after these types of things, unless you're talking about the FISA uh, waivers, which the uh, which the Senate uh, just passed uh, uh, this week. I mean, that's definitely an issue too. But for uh, for Brianna, I wanted to ask her, hey, do you have thoughts on are, are, are Bitcoin transactions, private papers covered under or private papers, private effects covered under the Fourth Amendment? Well, so that's a really interesting question, and um, I, you know, I would I would attack this from a state level at this point because we're sort of witnessing like a multi pronged, multi sectoral approach to. Um, I would say answering that question in the, in the negative and, or excuse me, in the, in, yeah, no, it would be in the negative, <laughs> but I mean, like, look at Missouri, for example, and, and, um, so just this year, Missouri passed a bill called the, uh, money modernization, uh, trans, um, Money Transaction Modernization Act. Uh, I might be getting that wrong, but but here's here's the nuts and bolts of it, right? Um, essentially, any third party uh, that you would uh, buy through or transact through has to be licensed with the Department of uh, Treasury and the Department of Commerce, and uh, and then they passed a sister bill to centralize that to the federal level, um, and then any 30, in, in, any third party, um, this, this excludes banks, by the way, um, has to keep up to 3% of its entire bulk assets, um, or equal to 3% in reserves. Um, so, so we're not only seeing that, right, but then we're also seeing this massive vehicle rollout under, uh, like I said, under IEPA through Cepheus, through the Office of Foreign Asset Control, where an individual can be labeled as a um, blocked person, and any type of transaction, any type of um, assets can be seized. Um, and, and for the first time in American history, even just panning out a little bit more than that, we just witnessed as the Department of Treasury uh, deemed an individual a foreign uh, foreign adversary, a foreign national of concern, seized his assets under a uh, sealed indictment, um, and then took the entire contents of that bank account. It was $5.4 million out of a Texas-based bank account, Sunflower Bank, and appropriated that to the proxy war effort in Ukraine. So we're sort of watching as all of these vehicles simultaneously, I would say, are converging and acting in a manner that gives the State Department absolute authority to um, not only answer that question, but answer that question for almost all types of transactions and all types of currencies. Well, and what's concerning about that is that U.S. Marshal Service, the Department of Defense, the Bureau, these guys are pros. They're experts. They, these guys can do civil asset uh, forfeiture like no one's business and you give the type of authority that you're talking about to the state department to the treasury uh even give uh, agents uh the ability to hey we have some questions about how ten thousand some odd dollars were uh, you know, appear to be structured into this account it doesn't matter whether it's it's crypto or what they're drilling holes through your safes and they're and they're taking it and you know unless we get uh, you know, a better handle on what, how far do the Fourth Amendment rights actually extend to, to our papers and effects? I, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's be some issues. Well, I would argue at this point that we need to bring the Constitution into the 21st century. We need to have a um, online Bill of Rights. We need to have these rights, you know, codified or, or not codified, but guaranteed for all online transactions. And until we're able to accomplish that, um, I think we really need to pump the brakes on all of these sort of policing mechanisms online. Um, and specifically, uh, things like, you know, terrorism, cyber structure, cyber security infrastructure, like, it's, it's just moving so rapidly right now. If I could ask a question... Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. I think your hand was up next anyway, so go for it. 
you know, what are we talking about here? Because I don't know if, like, people are so smart, I'm not sure, like, what they're talking about, or, or like, I'm so smart, I don't think they're talking about anything, like, kind of relevant. So, I'm, I'm just trying to, like, zone in. What is the topic? What are we talking about? Uh, it, it, it's jumping around. Like, I'm trying to connect the dots. I'm having trouble. So, I'd I like just a little clarification before I chime in with my opinion on things. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Brianna was just responding to a question from Wade. I mean, I think overall we've just been going over in broad terms free speech, the Constitution, you know, I think specifically we were talking about, um, you know, is code free speech? And then we were just getting into some of the legal minutia around the administrative state and how it has the authority that it has, which I think is what Brianna has done a lot of research and specialization in. And then, of course, that digs down into property rights as well uh, and kind of defending those property rights, which property rights and privacy, I think, go hand in hand. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. Uh, Wade had a very specific question, though. So uh, I know you had your hand up, so if you have yeah, any... No, no, that, 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 that does make sense, actually. Um, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on. Uh, the more money that goes to Ukraine the more unrest happens in the United States. I mean, uh, as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine and we took the stance of just dumping like hundreds of billions of dollars in Ukraine, right then and there, you'd be able to know that all this unrest would unfold in the United States just, you know, a year or so, you know, after that. And we just dumped another billions of dollars in Ukraine. That, what do you, why do you guys think that Israel got attacked. Why do you think that the Palestinians went in, or Hamas, or whatever it is, went into United, uh, Israel and, and did what they did? It, now we gave more money to Ukraine, and it was just feeding the war. It's going on and on. You're seeing this breakout in the United States. You're seeing all the protests unfold. We're going to see where it goes, but, I mean, Gary touched on it. it, it the United States has got a big problem right now. We're not sure what's going to happen, but, it, you know, Donald Trump is probably the answer to the equation, to be honest with you. I mean, that's, that's just what we need to have. It really, it's really too bad that I look at people, that some, some people out there that I really inspire, and, and, they're, and they don't understand that Donald Trump's the last one, the, the last president that can make a difference here. If, it doesn't, if Donald Trump doesn't get in there, what do you think is going to happen? Can anyone, can anyone answer that? What's going to happen if Donald Trump doesn't get in there? Because I feel like that people that spoke up, people that uh, took the initiative to, to make a difference in, in the, um, I don't know, traditional American way, are going to be arrested and thrown in jail. And that's probably the exact message that they're putting out for a reason. To shut everyone up, keep them off the streets, keep them from protesting, keep them from uh, even... The, the, people are so scared that they won't even call the library to say, we're not on board with the drag queen story hour coming in. Now, the drag, uh, you know, the, the drag queen story hour, they're saying free Palestine. You see those videos coming out today? Anybody see those videos? It's another no, faction I of... Uh, videos. You haven't seen them? Well, go look, because they're right there. Drag street, the, the, the drag queen story hour is literally telling you free Palestine now. They're, they're, in, they're intertwining the movements across the board. It's so, it's so predictable that it's so obvious. Some people have a hard time seeing it, but, you know, us Trump supporters, and I am a Trump supporter, we can see it. Apparently other people can't. I'm going to land there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming up, Andrew. I mean, the one thing that I'll, I'll say for this room in general, just... My my vibe, by the way, is that no matter what, even no matter how the election goes, I'm super bullish on America, um, and I think it's good to know what the problems are, and uh, finding the problems are important, and I never want to disregard the problems, and I, like, Wait, I Sam, love... Samuel, 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 you're yeah, what yeah, do you mean yeah. either way the election goes? I don't think America is going to end if Biden wins. Do you have any? Do you have any kids? I'm just wondering because my kids are in the public school system, and they're trying to tell them that you know gender this and the whole deal. Like I don't even feel like going through the whole yeah, deal. Yeah, sure. But it's a complete indoctrination. So we need. See, do you know that Donald Trump goes out there 
and he goes on his campaign, and he goes, like, before he was uh, summoned to New York City nonstop, he used to go on campaign trips, and he used to go across the country, and he'd say, these schools that do this indoctrination with the LGBT and the uh, transgender, you know, I'll keep it polite, bull, they're going to get defunded. And a state like Massachusetts is $56 billion, okay? $1.5 billion comes from the federal government. You take that away, that's a big deal. Colorado, I think the budget's around $30 billion, maybe something like that. Same amount of money going out there. That's a big deal. These teacher unions, they're totally in bed with getting Donald Trump out of there. Do you understand that? Yeah, Th absolutely. That's how it works. No, I'm, listen, so I'm th very there's aware. Big, there's big game out there. No, I'm very aware, but that's still, my point is always going to be that, once again, regardless, like, I'm very bullish on America, right? And so I get a lot of people who are like, you know, this election's the last one or whatever, and I've been hearing that, you know, since I was a kid, actually. Um, and things could be getting worse and things get worse and they get more extreme, um, over time. And that's just kind of nature's cycle. Uh, but it, it, it sounds like you've actually be de you've been desensitized to what's going no, on. No, I just that's, have a, that's the problem. It's a sigh no, and you should go. Re no. And like, um, we're not going to get into this too deep cause we have other hands, but the reason I'm saying this is as an overall vibe check for the room, I'm very bullish on America. Right, no matter what happens, uh, and the American spirit, I think, is still alive. And the fact that we're even having the conversations that we're having, where people like yourself too, just have a lot of passion. I think that's key because passion and what I call memetics is what wins modern warfare, and that's a good thing, right? So I'm not trying to disregard anything. I'm just trying to put like a, an overall perspective. Uh, which I think is just very positive, even when we have a lot of negativity around us. That That's my general point. Prometheus, I know you've been waiting there patiently. I appreciate you were like the third person to share the space. So you're the man. And I appreciate your comments, by the way. You're always such a big fan of, of Gary and mine's conversation. So what do you got to say for us today, Prometheus? Thank you, Sam. And excellent room as always. Gary, good to see you and everybody else uh, here. Um no, I've, I've been listening intently and just relating to um, some of the things uh, that are happening here in the UK as well. We're having this uh, new crypto bill that's being passed and it's it's already, you know, having all kinds of issues when it comes to like be us being able to access some of the, like the, the smaller exchanges and whatnot. But it seems to me that what we're experiencing now is a coordinated legislative effort to regulate um, for TradFi, shall we say, um, the, the uh, Wild West of, of Web3 um, the world over, right? Like we're seeing it not just in the UK, not just in Europe, not just in the States and Canada, it's everywhere. When have we seen this before? Oh, did, did it happen with, you know, medical legislation these past few years with this incredible coordinated effort? Oh, how did that happen? You know, all these countries that struggle to relate to one another in, on, on the regular, all of a sudden, my oh my, they, they just managed to have this incredible, <laughs> you know, uh, coordination. Uh, am I the only one noticing this? I hope not. Um, but uh, going back to what we can do about it, first and foremost, folks, we got to remember who we truly are, okay? We are children of the most powerful force in this universe, as, as far as I'm concerned, a each and every single one of us, okay? It it's, it's, it's a spiritual war. It's, it's much bigger than just kind of surface level issue of free speech here or, you know, um, asset custody there. It's, it's, it's much deeper than that. Um, and I believe what we're witnessing is the death of the old system and the birth of a new one. Um, there's there's a bunch of really great uh, prophetic voices one listens to, and they're they're all saying that America is about to go through. You guys are about to go through a a rebirth. 
okay the, across, uh, over the next year or so since for whatever reason there like this this next prepare for a roller coaster but there's really positive things on the uh, other side of it and that's where by the way i agree with you samuel like you know i'm very bullish in america as well okay long term you guys are going to be phenomenal i think this next trump presidency is going to be epic because uh, first of all the reason i say it's very likely it's going to come is because it's already been prophesied that it's going to come and his first presidency was actually prophesied as well by a genuine prophet you guys can look him up his name is kim clement his dead he's dead now but you know every single word that he gave they they've all come to pass so uh, there's a lot one can say about this i'm i'm going to i'm going to land my plane here for the moment because i know we have a lot of hands i really appreciated what simon said what gary said and you know what all of you guys have been uh, speaking about so far but uh, i'm so grateful gary to yourself that you're you're holding these rooms we can have like these radical discussions about truth and i think th uh, we are the new media and we can shift uh, the narrative we don't have to fear what it is these these fools are perpetrating out because uh, the people can always do better so anyway thanks very much hey really appreciate it as always for coming up prometheus you are the man uh david i know you've had your hand up go ahead You there, David? Yeah, hey, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear it's, you. It's been glitchy. Um, I was just texting. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for having me up. Just wanted to say what's up to you guys and what's up to Gary. And um, I mi literally missed the last, I don't know, six or seven minutes. So I'm not sure what you guys are talking about, so I don't want to change the topic on you. Um, but I was No, but you're earlier. good. Change the topic. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, so I know the... Um, you know, just listening, it's, you know, it seems like it's kind of getting scary now for people that keep their, you know, their their uh, assets, their, their crypto on these exchanges, and we're hearing a lot more about it, and, you know, the government just jumping in and, and you know, taking people's stuff, seizing people's stuff. So what do you guys, uh, you know, and I, I am a, I'm a little guy in the space, you know, I, I'm excited. Gary got me into this around October. I just hit my first you know, my first coin. So I'm kind of a little guy in the Bitcoin world, but should someone like me, me be worried about that? Or should people with a lot more, you know, like, like, you know, millions and millions be the ones that are concerned about getting, keeping their money off of these, these, um, exchanges. Just kind of like you, to get your are thoughts you, on Are that. you asking whether like, like some of these lawsuits, like, do you think the government's going to come after you for holding like your Bitcoin on cold storage or something or what do you yeah can you good, go good, deeper good. yeah great question so i know it's like do you i know we're just hearing a lot more about um people not feeling secure or safe having their money on exchanges like coinbase or or other exchanges um because you know who knows what can happen right so i'm just kind of thinking are you guys and and are you are we more concerned like for people with much larger holdings on those or is it like, should the little guy, you know, maybe, I don't know if I'm a little guy, but somebody with a couple thousand dollars, should they even be worried about something like that? Or is it just people with a lot more? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, it's such a subjective question because I always think, um, one, there's no perfect option, right? And I always tell people that uh, I could tell you the most secure way to store your Bitcoin and then <laughs> you lose the <laughs> you lose the hardware wallet or... I remember I had a hardware wallet that malfunctioned uh, and just I had to go buy a new one and reset it up. And um, I, the general rule of thumb, right, is you don't want it on an exchange. You want to do cold storage. But not everyone can do that. Not everyone can manage their own cold storage and all that stuff. Um, so it's such a relative question. I mean, I know people who are in the weeds on this stuff and they just diversify. They're like, oh, I got some on cold storage. I got some on the phone of my app. I got some on my computer. So there's no right answer, man. Um, no matter what, you're probably not going to be happy <laughs> with, with wherever you put it. Cause there's always some other option. That's kind of how I look at it. I don't know if someone has a better way to phrase that, well, but that's my so, general feeling. Yeah. Well, you know what? So like earlier I was listening on the space, Sam, and they were kind of telling people, Hey, if you have your, if you have anything on, on, uh, exchanges, you're at risk, get it off, get it on, you know, cold storage. And I kind of agree with you. I think there's a, there's a place where it's like, I don't know if you need to do that, right? If you, if you got a, you know, a few grand, yeah, sure, get it off, but don't risk losing it, right? 
but I, I feel like at some point there's a, there's probably a level where okay you got to make sure you're you're off. Does that make sense? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. What do you want to say? Yeah. Oh, Adam, you're, you're in and out. You're rugging hard, bro. Yeah, you're breaking up, Adam. You must be driving. Uh, David, I, I I'd like to take that. Um, yeah, I, I would. Peter. I would definitely recommend taking everything off centralized exchanges and and you know and securing it and, and learning how to do that uh, in a very expeditious way. I mean these these guidances, uh, these th guidance documents that these agencies are putting out. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, they're doing it for a reason, right? So they're they're basically warning you that they're going to be coming. So. I would definitely remove it, and um, I think a more important question, and one that I wanted to ask Brianna, but she stepped down, so anybody else who would know or have thoughts on it, please do step in and answer. What are some of the action steps that we could take, like, tomorrow to roll back some of these provisions or some of these things that we're seeing that these individual agencies without our say so are just taking it upon themselves to do how do we go back and roll back the patriot act how do we go back and get rid of fincen how do we get rid of sar suspicious activity reports how do we go back and get these people out and not comply how do we how do we then if but what do we plan for what groups can we put into place if we do have to go into federal prison that makes us comfortable that we are there could we link up with like you know other criminal organizations that are already inside to protect us? You know th these are the things oh, that man, I think you're we going should be... deep, man. You're going deep, Peter. <laughs> these are the things that you need to think about, though, because you got to be ready for that action, man. These people are coming, and they they'll do it no matter what. Like this is what they're about. They, they they literally will sell their grandmother down the river, right, for a, a forty five or fifty five k paycheck. This, these are the these are the nine to five ham and eggers that think they're they're doing it for justice and they've been sold the bill of goods. So we have our 70, 1776 moment rapidly approaching right now. So my question is, what do we do starting tomorrow to reverse this so we don't have to go to in the feds and you know live in a bathroom with another man for perpetuity? I mean, there's I, a... I thought, uh, yeah, go ahead, from, yes. yeah uh, great question, Peter. All right, so I don't know how familiar you are between common law versus maritime law, uh, or maritime legislation, rather, and this is something that's across the board uh, for the UK, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. It's, it's the common law countries. Um, so basically, there's a difference between you, the... Um, the paper version of yourself in capital letters and the birth certificate uh, maritime law, which is essentially your representation of yourself versus you, the living man or living woman. And I've actually linked a comment in the chat where the judge walks out of a court court case when um, uh, the gentleman uh, asserts his uh, living man, sovereign man, um, uh, rights in court and uh, the entire legal system by the way actually mostly knows this okay they know that at some level because just look look at what they pass they're all called what they're act Okay, Parliament passes acts, Congress passes acts, okay, the Patriot Act, the whatever, whatever act, okay, they're actors who are acting, okay, like this is, I know we're going a little bit off, off track here, but I hope this kind of a answers your questions because there are people who've genuinely defended themselves in law, including myself, by the way, okay, like I, <laughs> they tried to throw a few acts at me whilst I was, um, protesting against uh, the lockdowns here in the UK and I actually got arrested and uh, thank goodness you know I was I was to whatever degree sober enough to you know <laughs> know my rights at the time and I, I never you know essentially complied with these verbal contracts that the police put you into you know here in the UK like for example it is perfectly lawful as long as you're not harming anybody for you to drive around without a driving license 
for example, okay, because that is a commercial activity that's regulated. You know, as soon as you register your car, they actually own your car and you're just the driver of it. So it, instead, what I do is, no, I that's under a trust. It's, it's my car. Um, th there's a whole bunch of things that most people don't know about when it comes to trust laws and, and why it is people... Um, you know, put their entire companies and estates into trusts rather than, um, you know, into into the the like the legalistic framework that they've got set up. So this is a deep conversation, my friend. So I, I don't want to hog the mic here too much. So uh, maybe if you DM me sometime, we can we can go deeper with it, or we can even do like a dedicated space, Sam, Gary, if you guys are you know into common law and and, and those kinds of things. But yeah, there are ways around it, but you you need to dig deep and and. Uh, um, yeah, just just learn about how to uh, assert your natural rights under the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States is the single most like powerful document to ensure individual freedoms the world has ever seen, and it remains to this day. You know, you guys, <laughs> like I'm I'm here in the UK, like. You know, we have the Magna Carta and a few things, and it's still pretty good, but it's nowhere near as powerful as the U.S. Constitution. So please don't take that lightly. You're, you're actually providing free speech, the First Amendment to the whole world through X. And, you know, I've, I've had deep discussions into the night with Elon uh, about this as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal moment to be alive in, and you're absolutely right to ask the question, right, what can we do? Because there are things you can do. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give a real uh, simple and boring answer, and then I'll, I'll move it on to uh, Dan, because I want to get his quick opinion on something, and then Mark, I see you got your hand up. Um, don't be nerds and just be online. Uh, go build community, right? Uh, once again, it's cool to talk about this stuff, but like, go to church, join a gym, get a hobby, make friends. Um, a lot of the problems in today, you can't vote your way out of. Uh, I can give you suggestions about how to get politically involved, and that's great. But even that, you might not find fulfillment. A lot of people want to look at the news and just uh, complain and be bitter uh, about the situation. And that's okay. You can do that. But if you want a real road to success, if you're looking around and you're like, man, I have no friends, I have no community, no matter whether things are good or bad, you're screwed, and that's a terrible position to be in. And so I think a lot of people should really think about spending more time about, you know, do you actually know your neighbors, dude? Like, do you actually, have, where are your closest friends? How close are they to you geographically? Um, you know, what are your hobbies? Do you have friends through hobbies? Who are you talking to? That stuff, if you want to be politically active, just go make friends. And that sounds so stupid and cheesy and simple, but that will solve 90% of the problems that you have in your life. I guarantee it. Um, Dan, I know you've had your hand up for a while. What you got to say, dude? Yeah, no, it's, I think this is a really fascinating conversation. I mean, there's been so many strong opinions, uh, rightfully so, on a lot of this. And, you know, as a matter of, um, you know, free speech, I mean, that goes hand in hand, part and parcel, with Bitcoin and the philosophy behind it. I, you know, I, I actually just got back from New York City uh, a few couple hours ago, back down to Washington, and... You know, we're seeing that, I mean, there's the protests out there were completely out of control. Um, I mean, you could really caught me by surprise. I'm not sure how much the mainstream media is covering it. The local media was covering it. Um, and, you know, it, I think both sides, I suppose, of this issue uh, are raising, you know, serious concerns of how far freedom of expression can, can, can really go. And, you know, when I walked out, they were blocking these bridges, and quite a few of these these folks were just degenerates. I mean, they were on the street. I don't think a lot of them even realized what they were protesting um, at some point. And where's the, where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line over what is uh, freedom of speech versus, in, versus disrupting civil society? And, uh, and then the other question, just the other point I was going to make, and we can continue that conversation. It was probably part of a larger conversation, but I wanted to pick up on, you know, what we can do as an industry to prevent, you know, future pieces of legislation and regulatory acts from taking hold, which oftentimes come is in a knee-jerk reaction, like the Bank Secrecy Act was mentioned, the Patriot Act after 9-11, um, suspicious, suspicious activity reports. You know, right now we have two very large bills, Kansi, and DAMLA, which are both proposed by Elizabeth Warren, uh, these are just super um, anti-crypto bills in general that are going to impose bank secrecy requirements on individuals and other network participants should they pass. 
it expands uh, entities under BSA to include miners, validators, wallets. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. I don't think it's going to pass, but we're fighting it pretty hard up here in Washington. And the industry needs to help with this. And also the industry needs to be good actors because the more shenanigans we have, the more FTXs of the world that we have, it makes you know, our industry, it, it just gets so much more scrutiny that's not necessary. Uh, and 2023 was really the whole year was about rebuilding, regaining trust after that cataclysmic year of 2022 and FTX. So I think I think everybody needs to be good actors and do the right thing uh, and, and also just respect the freedom of speech. But... I, I just I just have concerns again. What I meant, so what I saw earlier in New York City, I thought it was really just ridiculous, and it really just it makes you think. What 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 is too far? It is interesting, right? Because I know as soon as we decide to regulate some of this stuff, um, I mean, it is what is too far. But I, whew, I'm scared to regulate protesting. I know we already have quote unquote regulations about free and fair protests, but I just know, I just know, as soon as that's regulated. Uh, it's going to be taken to a certain degree, and it's just one of those things where you take you take it all. You hate some of it, but then you love some of it, and it's just so like freedom of speech. Same thing, right? It's tough. I got no answers for you. Um, hey guys, yes, that's almost that's people are tired of the double standards. They're tired of the double standards because I think some protesters of the last few years were thrown in prison, oh, and other ones are doing honestly, some worse things, and nobody's even covering it. Well, that's the real key is, you know, as long as there's people in power and humans in charge, there's, there's going to be a double standard for any law. One of the biggest um, points I made on an episode I just did today with, uh, with Gary was freedom is a tool. And by that, I mean freedom is a tool that beats someone up or saves somebody. You know, freedom itself, freedom in the name of freedom, freedom in the sake of freedom, does not guarantee that it's going to be used for a good thing. I know some people don't believe that, but that's what I believe. And I think freedom can be used to hurt certain things. That's a tough conversation. Um, and guys, at, at eight o'clock, I got to hop off. Gary, I don't know. Chris, I don't know how much longer you guys want to go. Uh, but so I know I'm going to start to wrap it up, sort of, right? I know, Mark, you had your hand up. I see uh, Bitcoin in mining, Alex.BTC. I mean, y'all got some long names in here. Um, <laughs> Mark, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, just, you know, offering, I, I hear these spaces, they help me. Um, and I'm going to share that, you know, I've been in uh, the finance business for about 35 years. I work for a Canadian ETF firm. And when we're talking about custody, you know, I'll offer that. I think it is um, it is a decision of, you know, do you go to the ETF because it's easy and then you get out as soon as you can um, and try to sell sovereign but there's a risk there. So I, I, I think it is a not, not a personal decision, but it is, it is based on the person's ability. And, um, you know, at our firm, we actually have an ETF, so we want people to buy the ETF. But just to let you know where we're working, like we also then spoke to someone and said, we think it makes sense to get, get in now. Just get in. We like the price action. And then we're working with them on a hardware wallet. So we know where the game's going. Price is higher. Adoption's higher. Our model's changing. So I'm just being transparent on, on what we're doing professionally. And personally, same thing. I got friends in TradFi who have no interest. So we kind of walk them in and say, how's it going? I know you're set. How about your kids? Are they set? So the second topic besides custody was community. And that's dead on. There's so much noise going on, guys. And so locally, if you can just with your friends or, or in these types of spaces, you know, socialize ideas about the best way to fortify um, everyone's, you know, financial future and sanity check on having conversations that make sense. So thanks for the space. Those are my two sets, and I'm around if anyone wants to talk. Thanks. Absolutely, Mark. Love it. And very cool that you're in the ETF side of things, too. I think that's, that's really neat. And you're in Canada, you said? I'm a New Yorker, born and bred. I'm, I'm going right now on Washington Place, um, but my firm is a Canadian firm, yes. Got it. Cool deal. Cool deal. I won't hate on you for being a New Yorker. I'm down here in Florida, so uh, <laughs> I expect to see well, you my, down here in the next 10 years. That's what all New Yorkers do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. All my, all my wealthy friends and my family's moving down, so I'll probably see you soon. Of course. That's right. That's right. All right. Bitcoin and mining. Uh, 
Alex.BTC, what you got to say? You've had your hand up. Awesome. I'll be real quick. So obviously post Celsius FTX, um, a lot of talk to bear market, get your Bitcoin off exchanges. I think the, 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 the pressing question, the burning question is uh, for those that do have cold storage uh, with the FBI, uh, FBI notice today with a non KYC, do we know a definitive answer if our, you know, our, our Bitcoin and cold storage is, is in fact safe? Uh, from from this kind of stuff, uh, if anybody can shed a light on that and what the implications could be and what we can do if 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 maybe it's not. Just to clarify, and I think that's a Dan question. Uh, you're asking if the cold storage is AML KYC compliant. Correct with with the notice that came out today. That I guess it was the the MSB portion of the FBI notice. I actually I think it is, but does anyone want to correct me if I'm wrong on that? Uh, I think it just had to do with like you continuing to use exchanges that don't um, have the MSB license as well yeah. as in, in, engage with the AML and KYC, right? So what we saw yesterday with Samurai Wallet uh, founders getting arrested, that was what they're talking about. But just inherently having it in cold storage, you're not violating any law. It's, it's the process of using a mixer, which they don't like because the government needs to be able to see everything you're doing all the time. That's the, that you understand this is the same nonsense when they took down the Twin Towers with the CIA back in 2001. They used that as a guise to tighten the noose. This is another noose tightening event and they're going to continue tightening nooses. So you should be fine for now, but you know, it's, it's very, very, very concerning and that people are asleep at the wheel and court care more about nonsense on TV and other crap is, is frightening. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that on. Yeah. 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 Because then I offload to Coinbase. So obviously I'm KYC, but definitely, uh, I think even, you know, a future space to get some of these CEOs of these companies to talk through some of this stuff. Cause there's a lot of anxiety out there right now. And, and we, uh, yes, we got to advocate, step it up. I saw Dennis Porter just tweeted earlier. Uh, there's some blockchain guys in different States, but, uh, I'm definitely going to get my voice out there and get involved because this w woke me up. So thank you guys. Yeah, and shout to Brianna because she was what she was talking about earlier is so important. We do need to have a national conversation, and there do, does need to be an upgrade to like a digital bill of rights act. Right? If if we believe in the bill of rights and it extends to all facets of our lives, then it has to extend to our digital lives as well. It, it, it's the future, so why would it not extend into that realm? Yeah, I just want to I just want to say on that if I can, um, like a, a government agency putting out a warning and people getting this this hurts me deeply hearing how people are thinking the self-custody of your own bitcoin means that your bitcoin is at risk because of what the government's saying um you know this has to go through due process this has to be um it's completely unconstitutional all the debates we've been talking about um it infringes upon the foundation and the fabrics of what made america america um, and the fact that you're, fool, you know, being fooled into thinking that just like, you know, it was a very deliberate effort to get everyone to digitize their cash, saying that it's about anti-money laundering and terrorism, when we all goddamn know that it's all about tax collection, um, and it's a financial transaction, because once they can digitize all your money, uh, they can automate tax collection, they can do everything um, that, that the government wants to do. Um, so understand your rights, know your rights. This is a fight um, just because a government wants you to believe that you owning your own money is not a right that American people have doesn't mean that that is true. Um, and so, you know, the whole argument about self-custody, this is not a simple conversation. Um, the difference between leaving money at an exchange changing ownership, whether you hold it via a trust or whether you hold it via an ETF or whether you hold it in your own name. Uh, these, in, these go into security questions. You know, you should, do you trust yourself to secure them? Well, it's a journey. Everyone should get there. In fact, it's fairly easy to end up securing them in the end. It's just something that you have to learn. And by the way, you need to learn this because in the future, your identity will be something you have to own. All of your data 
um, owning your own financial transactions um, is something every a skill that everybody needs to learn into the future. It's just the way that we're all moving. If we allow the government to be custodians, this is exactly how assets get confiscated um, and you end up in draconian policies. Now, if you want to hold them at an exchange, that's not a good idea. Uh, there is a massive, and I'm a shareholder in over 100 of these different companies over, over time, and there's a big, big, big um, history of these exchanges losing funds. You want to hold it with a custodian um, that where you have legal title and full segregation of those assets. So if you hold it in an ETF, that's done through segregation, and you should still have legal title in the court of law. Um, a lot of these, you know, custody versus um, uh, exchange cases have actually were fought, and this was the whole thing around the FTX case and the Celsius case. There's also tax implications if you hold things in your own name versus um, holding them through an entity. There's also inheritance consequences. Only your own key versus being able to. Um, go through, you know, a, a process of passing on your accounts and putting that in your will. Uh, th these are all big conversations. And as your wealth grows, it's it's vital and important that you get to diversify your risk from government confiscation, 